Are you on with this one? Yep. Thank you, Oscar. Yeah, good morning. Uh, it's good to see all of you this morning. It's a bit of a gloomy day, but um, it's lovely to be sharing God's Word with each other. Um, yeah, a bit of a bit of a crazy passage, a bit of a passage result. It has, it has a lot of things in it, so hopefully we'll get to see what's going on a little bit. We're in the second last chapter of Ephesians. Uh, Paul continues to describe for us what it looks like to live as people united to Christ. And if you remember, Paul's message so far has been that God has united us to Jesus, and so we have a new life. And our new life is showcased in the way we interact with each other as a church, the way we lovingly build each other up to mature into Jesus. And so this section of uh, the letter, Paul is dedicating quite a, quite a part of his letter to, to talk about a specific part um, of our lives and of our love for each other. Um, and that is the topic of sex, right? The topic of sex and sexual immorality. Uh, the city of Ephesus, um, the city of Ephesus was a pretty famous city, but what was it famous for? It, 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 was, it had lots of money, had lots of trade, but it was really famous for um, being home to one of the seven ancient wonders of the, seven wonders of the ancient world, the, the great temple of the goddess Artemis. Now, Artemis was worshipped as the goddess of the hunt, so of hunting, but, as, but also as the goddess of fertility. But historians say that it wasn't just Artemis that was worshipped in Ephesus. There was another Greek god that had a big following, and uh, the, that Greek god's name was Dionysus. Uh, Dionysus, uh, also known as Bacchus, was worshipped as the god of fertility and wine and ecstasy. And, and the way that Dionysus was worshipped and, and Artemis was worshipped, because they're, they're the goddess and the god of fertility and wine and ecstasy, um, the followers, what they would do is they would throw these massive festivals. And these festivals would be filled with drunkenness, and with orgies. So for the Christians in Ephesus, to live in Ephesus was to live in a world surrounded by sex. And it's quite likely that many of the Ephesian Christians had probably participated in those festivals before they had met Jesus. Now, how do you think Ephesus compares with our world today? living in Sydney. I, I think it's actually quite obvious that our society is overcharged with sexual content. It's almost impossible to watch a TV show or listen to popular music or tune into a comedy special or sometimes even just have a casual conversation with someone at work without having to engage with some sort of sexual reference. And, and, you know, I, I'm always amazed at how popular Korean culture has become, and I, I'm pretty sure I've benefited from it. People think I'm cooler than I actually am. Um, <laughs> maybe that's even why I got the job here. But, it, it, but of course, like, Korean culture, it, it's not just all kimchi and makeup, is it? it it's just the other day, in, uh, I was having a conversation with some friends. We were talking about K-pop, and it struck me how disgusting it could be to have young girls who are debuting as early as 14 or 15 and, and older men are, are glued to the screen, watching them dance, zooming in with high-definition cameras. And I'm not saying that you know, everything about it is necessarily sexual, but, I mean, if we're honest, we all know that sex sells. Now, reading this passage over the week really just confronted me about how absolutely normal it's become for people, 
for Christians and maybe even for myself to enjoy and celebrate and promote obviously sexual content as good and fun and innocent and normal without a second thought. And now you might say, Stephen, Stephen, I think you're overreacting a little bit. Um, And maybe I am overreacting a little bit. But a a study done in the US in 2022 reported that 73% of teenagers between the ages of 12 and 18, so before before they turn 18, had already been exposed to pornography. 73%. 15% of teenagers said that they had first seen pornography before they were 10, whether it was by accident or on purpose. In another survey performed by, in the US, uh, 70% of church-going men admitted to regularly viewing porn. See, I might be overreacting on some things, you know, talking about K-pop, but those numbers tell us that on the whole, as a church, as Christians, we probably aren't reacting enough. Now, what's the Bible's answer to sexual immorality? The Bible's answer is quite simple, and and this is what we're going to talk about today. It goes something like this. The Bible's answer tells us that experiencing Christ-like love makes us children of light, which causes spirit-filled songs of thanksgiving in our hearts. So so the answer to sin, and especially sexual sin, is for us to experience Christ-like love, which makes us children of light, which then causes us to fill our hearts with thanksgiving through spiritual songs. I'm going to pray. We need God's help as we come come to deal with this. Lord, um, you are telling us that we are new people, we have a new identity, we have a new life, and, and you're confronting us about not even having a hint of sexual immorality. You, you're telling us that we are children of light. You're telling us that we can sing songs filled with the Spirit. So, so we need your help to really understand this. We need you to free us and to uh, deliver us from our brokenness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let's begin with Christ-like love. Uh, we have to begin there because b- before Christianity is ever about what we do or how pure we are, how good we are, um, what we don't do even, it's always about what God has first done for us. And Paul said uh, last week that uh, we shouldn't grieve the Holy Spirit because we have already been sealed for the day of redemption. He, he told us we should be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other because in Christ, God has already forgiven us. So God has done something for us and in us that has absolutely changed us from the inside out already. We don't need to do things because we need to prove to God that we're worthy of being accepted, but we do things because that is who we are already are as God's dearly loved children who've been adopted into God's family by Jesus' death on the cross. Now, that's really important to understand. There's a reason why God's love for us in Jesus actually needs to be understood before we discuss sex and sexual immorality, and that's because the Bible tells us that genuine love Genuine love is personified and exemplified in Jesus because Jesus gave up His glory and power in heaven. Uh, Jesus found out uh, on purpose, willingly, by taking on flesh, uh, by living in obedience, He found, he, he, he found out what it, what it is to live uh, and be tempted and to suffer and to be lonely and to be forgotten and ultimately to be killed so that by His death, sinful people would be saved. So the, the Bible tells us that genuine love involves radical self-sacrifice. Genuine love involves radical self-sacrifice and the opposite of self-sacrifice, of self-sacrificial love, is greedy self 
indulgence. Friends, the, the root of lust and sexual immorality is not because sex is bad. It's not because sexual desire is bad. But it really comes down to the fact that we have not understood Christ's love for us. And so, therefore, we use sex for self-indulgence rather than for genuine love. Let's read what Paul says, verse 3 down. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those on who are disobedient, and therefore, do not be partners with them. Now, the Greek word for sexual immorality uh, covers every kind of sexual sin. In, in other words, all, sorts of, all, all kinds of sexual activity that's outside of God's uh, ordained context of a loving marriage between a husband and a wife. So whether that be premarital extramarital affairs. Uh, It could even encompass selfish and unkind sex within marriage, homosexuality, pornography, even flirting or conversations or or the way we look at someone else that that may not necessarily be in itself a sexual act, but it could be motivated by an unloving and impure heart. See, Christ-like love isn't expressed only in our actions, but in our thoughts and motivations and our speech, and that's why Paul says there should not even be a hint, not just of immorality and impurity and greed, but not even a hint of obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking. All of these things are contrary to God's example of genuine love. And the reason why Paul adds greed to, to this list is because greed is to want more than what's been given to you by God. Greed leads you to covet what isn't yours. So in this context, that's that's really what lust and sexual immorality is, isn't it? It's greed. Lust is to want something or someone that isn't yours. In other words, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, or, or your the person on the screen, even your husband or your wife, is, is not yours for you to use as a tool for your sexual gratification. And, and I can't say this any stronger than Paul himself. No immoral, no impure, no greedy person has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So uh, we need to see how serious God is about this. If God is so serious about sexual purity and, and, if, and if He looked into our hearts and our minds and our lives, even just for the past week, I wonder what God would see. But of course, you know, sexual immorality, is, it's not just about whether you looked at pornography this week. It's not just about what sort of conversations you had this week. It's not just about how many times you watched the Calvin Clyde ad this week. We aren't saved because we never fall to temptation. The, the real question is, the real question is, have these desires, have these things taken such a place in our hearts that we continuously and unrepentantly and unashamedly feed the idol of our lust? Do we feed it or does our sexual brokenness and need tell us how desperately we need Jesus? Does it ever, does does your thoughts, do your desires, do your temptations ever make you kneel before Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I I am tempted and I'm torn and I'm broken and and, and, and so I'm on my knees asking you for forgiveness, and not just for forgiveness, I, I need your help, the power to change and to put off my old self and to live in your resurrected life. 
If that is your prayer, that when you see brokenness in your life, that, that you come before Jesus and you say, Lord Jesus, I, I need to be forgiven and I need your power to live differently. If that's your prayer, then Paul gives to us the antidote to the poison of immorality. And in verse 4, he says the antidote to sexual sin is thanksgiving. And the first thought that came to my mind as I read that was, it sounded a little anticlimactic. I mean, if I'm battling against lust and pornography, if I'm struggling with boundaries, my first thought would be, well, you know, what I really need is I need to feel ashamed. I need some accountability. I need to set stronger boundaries. And we need those things. But why does Paul say thanksgiving is the cure? Well, he says that because if the root of our lust is the idol of self-satisfying greed, then the only cure to that is to find that there is only one person, only God can give us the love and fulfillment and satisfaction that our hearts are looking for, that, that we think quenching our sexual thirst will give us. Thanksgiving helps us see sex and each other as what it really is. Sex and sexual desire is not something to be ashamed of or afraid of or to avoid. Sex is God's good gift to us to be used as He designed for us to enjoy intimacy and commitment and genuine love between a husband and a wife. And the more we realize what a good gift it is to be used the way that God intended it, the more we will refuse to cheapen sex, to use it for our selfish pleasure. Pornography, adultery, infidelity, dirty jokes, flirting that leads people on, all of those things take what is precious and beautiful and gifted to us and cheapens it. I want to end this section by saying this. Now, Paul says, do not be partners with these people, with these empty words. And someone asked me after church the other week uh, in the evening service, someone asked me, Stephen, how can I have non-Christian friends who live in ways that are outside of God's design for sex, would hanging out with them be supporting their decisions? Now, where do I draw the line as a Christian? How do I, how do I interact with them? That's a great question. When, you know, when Paul says, do not be partners with such people, he does not mean do not associate with them. He does not mean do not hang out with them. He does not mean do not be friends with them because if that was what the Bible said, then we could never actually bring our non-Christian friends the gospel and we would never actually be able to have an influence in their life for truth and goodness. Essentially, we would have to leave the world anyway because, I mean, as soon as you step out, that's the culture we live in. But Jesus did not leave the world. Jesus came into the world. So to not be partners... He's not talking about association or friendship. It's talking about participation. Do not be partners with them by participating in their sin. Do not be partners with them in the way they act, in the way they speak, in what they believe. But you can do this at the same time, not being partners with them and yet being such a friend, such a person that is so shaped by the genuine, self-sacrificial love of Christ in the way that you humbly and gently live with integrity to the truth, that you become a light for them. As Peter chapter 2 says, live such good lives in the world that even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Now, our friends, our colleagues, our family members, 
Our neighbors may absolutely disagree with the Bible's view on sex and homosexuality. Our friends may absolutely think we are stuck in the past for abstaining from sex before marriage or, or for pushing back against the narrative that pornography is healthy and just a, way, a part of growing up or for refusing to speak in a derogatory way about our wives or about other women uh, or about our husbands uh, that cheapens sex or other people. But maybe, somehow, in the midst of all that, by God's grace, they'll also see a hint of the love and fulfillment that the world is looking for in sex, which can only be found in Jesus. Christians have to live out Christ-like love as children of light. The, uh, the light that we have or have we become in Jesus becomes the light that we shine to others, which becomes their light as well. This is what Paul says, verse 8 down to 14. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, I want us to really think about what Paul is saying. In verse 8, Paul says, we are no longer darkness, but light in the Lord. And you may have picked this up, but notice that Paul doesn't say we were once in darkness. Uh, the Bible does say we were once in darkness in other parts of the Bible, but here, Paul doesn't say we were once in darkness. What does he say? He says we were darkness. Paul says we were darkness, and now we aren't just in the light, we are light in the Lord. Look, look the truth is that we weren't just in darkness or surrounded by darkness, or influenced by darkness, but we were darkness. Evil wasn't something, uh, sexual immorality, lust, greed, wasn't something that just influenced innocent old me from the outside. Evil really was in me the whole time. That's what, that's what Paul is saying. But the light exposes whatever is hiding in the darkness. The darkness wants to hide. Uh, the things that are shameful and ugly, the, the the reality of sin that's in each of us, but the light of Jesus exposes our sin. And when the light of Jesus exposes our sin, it actually makes us into light. We have become light, children of light. And as children of light, we are also agents of exposing the darkness around us. Paul says, um, the light exposes the darkness, and he calls us light. He calls us children of light. Now, that doesn't mean, uh, I don't know if you know what TMZ is, uh, that doesn't mean Christians are like TMZ or like paparazzis, you know, going around exposing people's darkness, you know, and, and shouting it on the streets, exposing people's secrets, or getting into arguments, you know, with people on the street about homosexuality. We, we need to carefully forgive uh, lovingly shine the light of the gospel into the darkness because we know that the light of Jesus brings life. And we want our church family to be such a family where we can share our lives with each other in love because we trust each other and because we need the help of other Christians who have the light of Jesus to expose our darkness and to bring us back into the light. And I know that sounds really scary. To have your darkness be exposed to other people. But remember, Jesus exposes our darkness, not to shame us, but to heal us. Everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated 
becomes a light. The gospel always does two things at the same time. The gospel will always take you down to the depths to face how sinful and evil we really are by exposing our darkness. And when it does, when our darkness is truly exposed, truly, truly exposed, when our darkness is exposed by the gospel, it will make you uncomfortable, it will make you ashamed, it will make you weep, it may even make you afraid, it will make you realize, man, forget blaming others, I really am that bad. And yet, the gospel will also always take you higher than you could ever dream because the gospel tells us that in love, by grace, God has united us to Christ to give us His perfect righteousness. And He raises us up with Him. He seats us with Him in the heavenly realms so that we are no longer condemned by our sin, but we have been made free to live by His Spirit. The wonderful news of the Christian gospel is that we are more sinful than we would ever dare admit, and yet at the same time, we are more loved than we would ever dare imagine. Only when we experience the gospel in this way, as children of light who know Christ's love for us, uh, will cause us, only then will it cause us to no longer chase after sex or other things that, that to give us the fulfillment or, or, or the joy or the love that we long for, but instead uh, we'll be able to truly sing to each other in the Holy Spirit. Loving each other like Christ loved us will make us sing with truth, true joy for each other. Now this is the last section, verse 15 down to 20. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Why do people get drunk? Now, people get drunk because you think if you get drunk, it will help you feel the bad things less and the good things more. We want to be drunk because being drunk gets rid of the pain, the the heartache, the sadness, to make us feel more happy and joyful. Well, I'm, I'm sure you all know alcohol is a depressant, meaning it depresses, it dulls, it deadens our senses. In other words, alcohol makes us feel a certain way by actually making us feel less, by making us lose self-control. Being filled with the Spirit does the opposite thing. Being filled with the Spirit heightens our senses. Being filled with the Spirit actually makes us more aware and more sensitive. It makes us more aware of the goodness and righteousness and truth of Jesus, which in turn also makes us more aware of the fact that we don't have that all the time. It makes us more aware that we are children of God and the power of sin no longer has a hold on us. It makes us more aware of the light that shines in our darkness. It makes us more aware of the light that we are in Jesus, that that we can and do shine in the lives of our brothers and sisters too. See, being filled with the Spirit makes us more aware of the fact that whatever we try to fill ourselves with, whether it be sex, whether it be alcohol, or anything else in life, It makes us more aware of the fact that those things will not give us the love or the happiness or the joy or the peace or the goodness or the self-control or the influence or the courage or the strength that we are looking for. 
The good news is that in Christ, we have all of those things already. Let's pray. Lord, um, yeah, there's a lot in here. Um, some things are more applicable to some of us, but we know that there is greed in each of us. There is idolatry in each of us. We, we, we look to other things to satisfy our need for love. We misuse your gifts. We cheapen the things you've given us for our self-indulgence. We are children of light, and the fruit of light is, is goodness and righteousness and truth. And we have in you the absolute privilege and joy and blessing of being a light to others, to expose the darkness in us and around us in love. But we don't do that well. Oh, instead of being filled with the Spirit, we choose to fill ourselves with other things that make us lose self-control, that make us dull to your love for us. Lord, we want to bring these things before you today. Whatever it is that you are saying to us here, whatever temptations, whatever failures, whatever idols we have in our heart, whatever ways that we have failed as a community to really show genuine love to our brothers and sisters here or even to people, that strangers that we have thought about or talked about or looked at the wrong way. We know that that does not honour you. Those things have no place in your kingdom. So Lord, we just take some time now to come before you in repentance. Let me invite you all to just take some time now, just a minute, um, just to reflect on this great gift of love, genuine love that Christ has given to us. Yeah, Lord, we repent as a church that we probably have failed to give you thanks as you deserve in all of our lives, that we have failed in many ways to be a light for each other, exposing our darkness. Sometimes maybe we have exposed people's darkness very unlovingly. Sometimes maybe we failed to even care. We need your help to live as children of light. Help us know more and more the gospel that tells us how loved we are, even though we are so broken. Help us to go out and be your light in the world, that people might look at us as we live in the gospel and say that, God, you deserve all the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.